Good evening, everyone. Let me begin by saying what a pleasure it is to speak to you this evening. This is not going to be a conversation about how great women are and how great women are doing. This is going to be a conversation about the work women still need to do. To build on from the generation that preceded us and to build the future of the unborn women to come. Now I'm going to take some liberties because the theme of this evening's talk is hashtag Shungu. If you are the daughter of an African Zimbabwean mother like me, the term Shungu ought to be starkly familiar to you. I remember when I was about 16, my mom said to me, you know, when I'm good, Loosely translated, what my mom was asking me to do was to be determined so that I could stand on my own two feet and so that I could be independent and forge my own path. Now, all too often today, we don't have enough shungu in our young women. We've got the right to vote. We've got legal capacity. And so we don't take seriously the work that was done by the generations that came ahead of us. Just to give you an example, two days ago in Parliament, a female MP was fondled by the police. The acting Speaker of Parliament was a woman, and she laughed. No fellow female MPs came to her rescue. What did the rest of us women do? We circulated the video of her crying on WhatsApp. Now the question that's led me that this has led me to ask is what happened to women's liberation? What happened to the journey of feminism amongst women? What happened to the solidarity we used to have with each other? What happened to fighting for our rights? There was a time in the 60s where women were so furious about the rights that they wanted and aspired to, that they went so far as to say that, look, unless you take us seriously, we're going to burn our bras in protest. They didn't laugh when people said they couldn't vote. Even here in Zimbabwe, there was a time when women were not allowed to enter contracts by themselves. And I'm not talking about a long time ago. I'm talking about 1982. Women were controlled by what was known as the marital power. We seem to have forgotten that journey. There was a time that women were not entitled to property rights. It's only as recently as 1991 here in Zimbabwe that women were allowed to independently own property and have it registered in their own name. Now what happened to that cause? What happened to that trajectory? There's so much unfinished work that we need to do for the cause of women. We still have issues around paid maternity leave, the wage gap. I look at the university here, and I look at parliament, I look at everything, where we've got all these quotas for women. How come they're not translating into action? Thinking about the next generation, what causes, what problems, are women facing, and how do we fight for them? Now, obviously, feminism, as you've heard uh, repeatedly in discourse, has been termed something of a dirty word. In fact, if I were to ask you today how many of you are feminists, who would say yes? No, well, now you're going to say yes. <laughs> but a lot of the time, when you say to people, look, I'm a feminist, 
dentist, they look at you like this, as if it's something dirty, something wrong. All feminism is asking is for equality between men and women. Now the question I'd like to pose today is who killed the bra burners? Who killed that radical crop of women who saw one injustice being perpetrated against a single woman and decided that it was a, an injustice for all of them? What happened to that solidarity? What are women talking about today? What's topical for us? Interestingly enough, we do have a few feminists in popular discourse. Beyonce calls herself a feminist. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie calls her a feminist. And very recently, they had something of a tension around their idea of feminism. And so I looked at this quite closely. What was this tension about? It was the content of whether men are necessary or not to the existence of women. And Chimamanda published a, a Facebook uh, manifesto of sorts around feminism. And what she said was that, well, part of what she said was that marriage should not be considered to be an achievement for women. So when I saw that, I was like, yes, women's love, go. Finally, someone is taking us seriously. But when I took a step, step back to evaluate why I was excited, I became disheartened. This is 2016. And the debate that's topical amongst women is whether or not marriage is an achievement. This is three or four waves of feminism later, where women have been constantly fighting for rights. And all we have done as the current generation is reduced the idea or the concept of feminism to an idea as opposed to a cause. We're no longer fighting for substantive rights as women. The right to vote, the right to property, the right to paid maternity leave. Now just for your interest in Zimbabwe, paid maternity leave is not a guarantee anymore. The wage gap, a lot of you university students, You'll be shocked to find when you enter the workplace that what you're going to be earning, even if you're not told this, is going to be less than your male counterparts. There was a recent statistic that was put out that said 33% of women in Zimbabwe are subjected to domestic violence. 33%. That means a third of this room, if it were women, are subjected to domestic violence. And all we can talk about is whether or not marriage is an achievement. What happened to that drive, that ambition, that desire to fight for further and better substantive rights? There's an additional statistic that's been put out that says that every three hours in Zimbabwe, a woman gets raped. Every three hours, this is a 2015 study, one woman gets raped. Now the question that I'd like to pose to you is when are we going to put our concerns back onto the agenda? When are we going to put our fight and our ambitions back into mainstream politics? When are we going to care enough for what's a concern to us to start fighting again, to get back onto the streets for ourselves and for the generation that's to come. So I'm going to attempt to answer the question, who killed the bra burners? Was it men who looked at it and said, oh, bra burners are too radical. They're too militant. I can't marry someone who's so radical and so militant. Was it the generation of millennials who looked at the idea of feminism because we've made so much progress and decided that, look, it's not cool? 
Just to show you that feminism as an idea is on the decline. In 2006, Madeleine Albright made a speech at a luncheon to celebrate women. And she said in that speech, there is a special place in hell for women who do not support other women. This was met with resounding applause. Fast forward 10 years later to 2016, she said exactly the same words, that there is a special place in hell for women who do not support other women. And she received a backlash, not from men, but from young women. We have women who asked her, look, why should you tell us who to support? What's so special about supporting a woman? Why should the fact that Hillary Clinton is a, a woman qualify her for support? Now, obviously, I'm not saying that any woman that comes up and runs for office or is up for any position should be supported. But there was a time in our politics as women that the foremost idea was that we should support each other, that we should help each other, that we should pull each other up. Because the, the, the complaints that we had were the same. And so today, I fast forward and I look at it and I say, what happened to that? Just because a few of us have managed to penetrate the glass ceiling and are doing well, we've stopped to care. We've stopped caring enough because it's okay with us. But the onus really is on the women who've managed to penetrate the glass ceiling. Sadly, some of them, when they get there, they stop talking about other women and are happy to be the lone voice in power. That has to stop. The minute you penetrate the glass ceiling, the next question you have to ask is how do I use this position to speak up on behalf of other women who are weaker than me, how do I become their voice? More unity is required. We want to get to a place as women where we don't rely on quotas to get us to positions of power, but we rely on each other. We don't rely on other men to pull us up. And sometimes you will find in organizations that the men will be the first to identify that, look, that's a bright lawyer, that's a bright doctor, and yet there's another woman in a position of power who failed to notice other women in the same way. That has to change. We need to take the discourse around women back into the mainstream. The women's liberation movement has to suffer a rebirth because right now it's dead. Like I said, if a woman, a fellow woman can be fondled in parliament by the police and other women giggle, women's liberation is dead. And it's just a matter of time before that cancer starts to affect you in your own workplace. There's several statistics around sexual violence and sexual harassment. Those issues should never be allowed to occupy the fringes of the discourse in society. Those issues have to become mainstream. And we should not let the patriarchy or other men or other women at that silence us in our own cause. We need to be able to speak up for ourselves because the patriarchy is very clever. Someone once told me that the patriarchy is very quick to recruit women. So when a cause is belittled by society, a cause that's important to women, you have to think to yourself, on which side of the divide should I stand? We have to stand up for each other as women. Feminism should no longer be a dirty word. Feminism shouldn't just be an idea. Feminism has to become a cause and ultimately a movement again. When we talk of a movement, we're talking about something that's constantly in motion, something that's growing, something that's moving in a particular trajectory. We simply don't have that around women's issues anymore. There was a time when people started laughing even at the Sasa Project, one of the first organizations that stood up for women. We need to bring all of that back.
back. Especially because a lot of the women, particularly in this jurisdiction, are thoroughly disadvantaged. Don't think for a minute that because you've got access to university education, other women in the rural areas do as well. They simply don't. We need to start fighting for other women and for ourselves. Even if we look at our own state as women, we have not attained equality yet. Look at any boardroom. Look at any government institution that doesn't operate a quota. We have not had a single Minister of Finance who is a woman. We haven't had a Minister of Justice who is a woman. We haven't had an Attorney General, a Prosecutor General, a, a Chief Justice, so many key positions. And yet there are so many competent women. Every single year, universities are churning women out. We need to establish why. And we have to go back to the drawing board. Instead of trivializing the discourse around women's issues, we have to make those issues mainstream. And am I saying that a discussion around marriage is bad? Absolutely not. Continue to, you know, let's get married, let's have fun. But at the center of it all, let's not forget our own cause. Let's not allow these societal constructs to swallow us and swallow our agenda as women. We need to keep the agenda of the female cause on the table and not allow societal contract, constructs to make us believe that a tie to a man is the quality or content of an achievement because women are worth so much more. Women are so powerful. They don't need validation from anyone, whether it's their father, whether it's their husband, their validation comes from within themselves. And so now that we've established that, uh, we've established who or what, including society, has killed the bra burners, we need to start having a serious conversation, fellow women, about how we bring back the movement, how we bring back Shungu Zegu, our ambition, our drive, to become powerhouses in our own right and to be considered equal in society. Thank you.